gun is a tool, Marion. No better, no worse than any other tool. An axe, a shovel, or anything. A gun is as good or as bad as the man using it. Remember that. We'd all be much better off if there wasn't a single gun left in this valley, including yours. <laughs> Welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film. We explore its themes, its history, the filmmaking, and, John, the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Boris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. Uh, I agree with everything Steve just said. My name is John. I'm a, a John Roke. I'm a, a, a voiceover actor, writer, producer, and host here in San Diego, California, and mad lover of Westerns. And those of you who know me as the outlaw... You know how much I love this genre. So the fact that we're getting to talk about this film and getting to also have a special guest be a part of this conversation uh, means the world to me for sure. That's right. We have, and we're not having a guest in the way that we normally have in the past, yeah. but we are being joined for some of it by George Stevens Jr., the yes. son of the director of the movie we're talking about, which is Shane from 1953. And not only is George Stevens Jr. the son of the director, but he was on the set working as an associate producer on this film. So it is in some weird way breaking our rule of not having people talk about their own work, <laughs> but I feel real good about it. I yeah, feel real so good about it. This is such a window <laughs> into the past. And full disclosure, we haven't had our interview with uh, George yet. And yeah. so what we're going to do is we're going to have an interview with him, and then we're going to talk to him both about his life, which is an incredible life, and we're also going to talk to him specifically about the film Shane. And so what you'll hear throughout, I think, is that we're going to edit in his yeah. comments about Shane as we go through the film when they see a, seem appropriate. Yeah, and I think that's a good way to go about it because uh, we want to talk about it as we would talk about it without the influence of his experience or his opinion maybe coloring our approaches – and that way, when we hear his opinion on it, we could even maybe even do a short and go back and revisit this and kind of analyze mm. our points through his point of view uh, afterwards. But you all are going to get the benefit of his pure point of view and our pure point of view uh, on this movie, for sure. It is kind of changing the way we do things on the cinephiles, and hopefully yeah. it'll be the best of both worlds. And I am, John, I cannot tell you, we've been trying to set up this interview for yeah. a couple of months now. Crazy. and. I am so excited about it. It should be, Absolutely. I think, in three days we're going to be doing it. Yeah, we've had some really great guests on the program, and having someone like George Stevens Jr. on is, 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 a, is going to be great for us, man, for sure. Absolutely. So uh, how did you first come to Shane? Um, well, you know, like they t when I was getting into the Westerns genre, you know, once you move past Clint Eastwood or John Wayne, you're really like, okay, where do I go from here? And, of course, I'd seen that iconic Shane. The come yeah. back Shane. Yeah, I'd seen that in montages growing up as a kid, but I never really understood what the film was. And I and my and I didn't understand like what the power of this Western was. So in my 20s, as I've spoken about many times, I was catching up on movies, catching up on the AFI top, whatever. And as I slid into this one, I was excited to see what, what I was gonna get from Alan Ladd is not someone I had followed as a right. one of these classic film stars. Um, Gene Arthur, obviously, I'd love from uh, from uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington, I think. Yep. And so I wasn't sure what I was going to get here. And a young G Jack Balance, or shall I say Walter Jack Balance right. in this film, uh, I was excited to see the combo of all these people in once in one movie. And I tell you, this film did not disappoint the first time I watched it, sitting in that library, being caught up uh, with it, and loving the unusual nature of of this western he is a hero much uh in the same vein as we've spoken about before in the past steve uh with other uh films uh this idea that a hero it normally in westerns the guy can handle everything that's coming at him but alan ladd is always one or two punches away or a second uh, uh, away from being killed or beat up and it's incredible how he's just able to survive by the skin of his teeth in a lot of these situations. And I appreciated that film for its unusual approach to the Western genre. So uh, 
I saw this film. I agree with everything you just said, by the way. Hmm. I saw this film uh, when I was in high school and it was, hmm. uh, you know, I rented it from the video store on VHS. Yeah. Same as you. I had seen the iconic images. I had heard the name. My dad was a huge Western fan. Uh, so I kind of knew about it and I watched it and I don't think I got it. I think I was too young. <laughs> and I and and I I think I hadn't seen it since until i watched right. it just now really there's so wow. yeah and there is so much more in this movie that is so subtle that i didn't yes. understand i don't think i was mature enough to mm. see all those kind of looks and pauses yeah. and hesitations which is really where the movie lives and mm -hmm. maybe i was just kind of seeing it from the kid perspective like oh the mm -hmm. gunslinger rolls in we don't know much about it and he saves the day and then you know right. like and I didn't really see like, oh, there's all this other stuff going on. And then yeah. on doing some research about it, I, 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 it got even deeper for me. So I think mm -hmm. this is this movie just got better and better the more that I studied it. Yeah, Definitely. and you can you, you can tell Steve the influences it has on someone like Clint Eastwood, who's a massive fan of westerns. Obviously, uh, made his name on westerns, right. but th there are shades of it in High Plains Drifter, and there are shades of it in Pale Rider. Uh, so it seems like you almost almost some scenes are almost lifted from Shane. Certainly the scene in Pale Rider with the um, uh, with the prospector who is going there to confront the main bad guy, right. just like uh, our guy does in Shane. And the same thing happens to him that happens to the main bad guy. And so I'm oh, sorry the, to, to the guy that is in Pale Rider. So very interesting stuff here throughout this stranger drifting into town. It's going on the side of the good people, fighting this evil, and then drifting out of town, just like Pale Rider and just like uh, uh, High Plains Drifter. And one of the things that makes this film deeper is mm. that, and it's something we'll talk about throughout, but is that George Stevens is one of those uh, Hollywood directors who went to uh, World War II to film right. the war. And there's the documentary in the book, Five Came Back, that focuses on him. Uh, Stevens was one of the, at the opening of Auschwitz at the end of the war. Wow. So saw like the concentration camps firsthand. It had a profound effect on him. Yeah. And this is the stuff that I didn't understand when I watched it in high school is there's a lot of thought about violence going on here that's because yeah. of his experience in the war that is mm -hmm. really different from other Westerns. Mm -hmm. um, it's based on 1949 novel by Jack uh, Schaefer, and it was never specifically said in the book, um, but it's probably loosely based on the what's called the Johnson County War in 1892 mm -hmm. in Wyoming, which is literal battle between the cattlemen and the homesteaders. And this is this thing you and I have talked about now mm -hmm. since way back in high noon about Westerns is so many of Westerns are about the end of the West. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And this is too. It's like this yeah. is the transition from the cattlemen who are out in the open plains to the homesteaders yeah. who are starting to put up fences, you know? Yeah. And this is a deceptively well written film. Like you can mm. get caught up in the iconic, the iconography of Shane, the iconography of Jack Palance, uh, this idea of, you know, good versus evil and all the tropes that you've seen in Westerns before, you know, the dutiful wife who wants him to not fight and take his guns to town. It's all here, the young kid. It's all here. But the exchange to me that stuck out this time around watching it for this podcast is the exchange between is it Dy Striker or Dy the main Riker, Riker, Riker. the main bag, bad guy Riker, and his conversation with Van Heflin's character about you know we came to this country, yes. this area, and we built this thing with our hands and our sweat and our blood, and you guys come along with no appreciation for what we did, and you take pieces of our land and you take our water, and for the first time ever since wa I've watched this western, I was sitting there going, you know what? I mean, I can kind of see why he'd be upset. And yep. he's not a typical bad villain, a mustache twirling villain. This is the guy that, yes, he calls upon Jack Pounce later on in the film, but he's not a guy, as he says to the bartender, we kept our guns in our holsters. We didn't use our guns. We, we intimidated them. Yes, we set their stuff on fire and we ran over the crops, but we did not use our guns to try to intimidate them. But now I'm at my wit's end. So it's a very unusual villain in a Western that he's not all the way hateable, even though he's doing bad stuff. 
you can understand his anger. And then it feels topical as well, Steve, because we hear people nowadays saying, oh, these people come to this country and they take what we've built or they take what we've done. And, you know, Van Heflin comes back at that guy just like you would come back at those people and says there were people already here before you showed up, Riker. So you can't sit here and try to claim this is yours. So it's a fantastic discussion that still echoes 60 years later in our over 60 years later in our world, Steve. I, I, it's fine. I was going to talk about this when we got to the moment and we, yeah. and I'm sure we will, but, yeah. but yeah, I think it's an incredible moment in the film. And what I thought, because what Van Heflin says to him is, uh, that there were trappers and other yes. people here before you, Native, what he didn't yeah. say was that the Cheyenne were here before you. Right. And, and, and this is the thing is the Cheyenne could say the same things about the trappers. Like we had our life. Right. And then the trappers can say the same thing about the cattlemen, the home and the cattlemen say the same thing about the homesteaders. Well, the homesteaders are going to say the same thing about when cities come along or when big industrial farms and agriculture comes along, right. that their way of life gets gets destroyed. Is that the thing is, is this happens over and over and over again in society. And yeah, that speech is critical to yeah. framing the film. And yeah. it, it like you because I think up to that point. You, you're like this is a, here's the bad guy yeah and at that right. point it's like oh and this is the point where where you know 15 year old steve morris i don't think i was paying attention <laughs> you know what i mean like i don't think i had had that well and yeah. this is the interesting thing you know i know we're digressing a little bit or mm. or, or, or foregressing if that's a word yeah. to a part much later in the film but but like this is the thing about being a lover of film is that mm. you could come back to a movie yes and go like, oh, I didn't understand. I wasn't mature enough to get yeah. it at the time. As, as, as I've said a million times on this show, the reason these are classics are because you can revisit them at different stages of your life and to get so many different lessons and have different parts resonate with you that didn't resonate with you when you were younger or when you're older. It's incredible. And that's what I found so found find so great about these films as well, Steve. What's funny, John, is that even though the movie didn't really resonate with me when I was 15, it definitely did resonate with another teenager just about 70 years ago. And that teenager was George Stevens Jr. When I graduated from high school, I didn't have a job for the summer and dad hired me. And I had two functions. One was to break down Theodore Dreiser's great novel, An American Tragedy into a notebook full of every scene, character, all of that, because he was about to embark on the screenplay right. for what became A Place in the Sun, based on Dreiser's book. And the other job was to read the books and scripts and stuff that came from Paramount. I think it was his way of giving me a little taste of it to see if this is something that appealed to me. And I must say, most of the books were for a 17 year old kind of treacly love stories. And right. one, after, one book, book came and I read it in an afternoon and I went over to dad's apartment that night and he was in bed uh, reading. And I, I walked in and I said, dad, I said, I read this this afternoon. It's, it's really, a good, really a good story. I think you ought to read it. And he said, uh, why don't you tell me the story? Hmm. I found myself pacing around his bed, trying to tell him the story of Shane as I'd read it that afternoon. Wow. And then by a summer later, I was keenly interested and I worked on the location of Shane and a job called company clerk. So, so really we have you to thank for this film. If, well, if the, the, Yes, we can we can exaggerate it to that extent. <laughs> well, I mean, well, this is one of the things I always think about is how much luck plays a part in what movies get made and not made. It's all about things getting seen by the right people at the right moment and seeing what and, and what I'm curious about is what was it that you saw in that book that made you think this was something special that made you head to your dad's apartment? Well, it, it's just a good story. Uh, the film is very it's not not in any way exact but it's based on the same structure and it's a you know a little boy and a family and a mysterious guy from somewhere else and they have a problem with the cattle ranchers right so you went off to shoot it you went to the location what was that location like 
We, it's in Jackson Hole, Wyoming. Um, we flew up there on a DC-3, my father and the art directors, had to, to hunt locations. And he traipsed around and we drove Jeeps around and he finally found uh, that place where to build the town with a hill uh, on mm -hmm. the opposite where they would all enter almost like a portal riding through those trees which he, which he had planted up there and the cemetery there was a high ground in the distance where the cemetery because that had a relationship with the town when the right. Riker boys were sitting on the porch and that and the the burial of Stonewall Tory is taking place so you pick the locations and then we brought the crew up and we're there, I guess, for six weeks, maybe a little more, shooting all the exteriors and technical. And this is really in the middle of nowhere. This is a 45 minute ride from a small town to get to where they're shooting. That's where wow. they shot this thing. Wow. Most people have an image of Hollywood and movie making as this glamorous and mm. romantic thing. What was it like working on this location? It was hard work. I mean, we'd get up, we get in a, that we had a black limousine, a bit of kind of a beat up old limousine, but it, you know, and a guy named Harry drove it. We get up at, you know, 5.30 and get in that car, you know, and be on the location at 6.15 and be there all day. And But again, it was glamorous in a sense, you know, to ride out to that location and get out of that car. And there are all the horses, there's the, you know, the chuck wagon with the, the the metal pots of coffee and everybody out there doing their job, you know, getting ready for the day's work. And dad and screenwriter Ivan Moffat and Fred Gill, dad's sidekick, was worked with him on many of the films. The four of us would get in the car at the end of that long day and dad would sit back and say, kick it in the ass, Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Harry and we'd drive into the hotel and then we'd watch dailies. Right. You know, so it was it was really hard work. Right in the opening image of just these planes with the Grand Tetons in the background, it is absolutely spectacular. And we see a rider ride up into frame past the titles. A look at this incredible vista. Uh, the music score is Victor Young, and it's just an, a great, great score. And then we see an, an elk drinking in the water and a little kid who's stalking him with a rifle. Mm -hmm. By the way, it's real hard to get that elk to do what they wanted him to do. <laughs> Not an easy animal to train. And this kid is kind of stalking up on the deer. And this is Joey. This is one of our main characters. The actor mm -hmm. is uh, Brandon DeWild. He had been had some big roles on Broadway and that's where they found him. And mm -hmm. he takes aim and you go, Oh, he's going to kill this elk. And then he looks up and way in the distance, he sees a cowboy, which is of course, Shane. Somebody's coming, Pa. Well, let him come. Dad is out cutting a stump. There's so much symbolism here, Steve. Right yeah. from the beginning, right? Defenseless animal that's just trying to drink water, so take advantage of nature here and live. And a young kid who is, in essence, the aggressor who is kind of creeping up on him, possibly going to kill him, and Shane is the one that stops him. So right within the opening scene, we have the microcosm of what we're going to get in the movie. The homesteaders being the elk, uh, Riker being the kid, uh, 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 the Brandon Joey, and Shane coming along to stop it from happening. So it's just very interesting in a small microcosm how you got that. And then Joe with the stump, which is you know, this thing. If you yes. work hard enough at this thing, eventually it will move. But it's an obstacle for him right now. And that's what he's confronting right at the beginning of the movie. So and I'll take you to another level, too, is yeah. you have the kid playing with the idea of violence and killing. Yes, you that know? too. And Absolutely. that idea is so deep into this movie is the way that we fantasize or hero make heroic the idea of guns and killing. Yes. You know, Agreed. Mm -hmm. and Shane is riding up. He's all in buckskin. <laughs> By the way, he uh, in the book, he's dressed all in black. And they gave and said they gave the black oh. outfit to uh, Wilson, who is the Jack Pounce character. Right. Want to know who they wanted to play Shane initially? 
Ooh, interesting. Uh, 1954. Gregory Peck. Or no, wait. Uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, it's Gary opposite. Cooper. Gary yes, Cooper. Yes, it is exactly not yes. that. Oh, it no. is the total opposite of that. It's an <laughs> actor was? that you love. Okay. And that and that is Montgomery Clift. Oh, wow. That's a whole other movie. Yeah, that's a completely different movie. Yeah. That's a much more tortured film. Yeah. And he's younger than Alan Ladd, so it's it's more of a yeah, it's way more of a younger tortured man than an older tortured man at the end of his time as a gunslinger or near the end of his time as a gunslinger. Very interesting. Okay. Yeah, it, it, but but they ended up going with Alan Ladd and Alan Ladd he he was contracted to Universal at like the it, it, like right out of high school in 1933 mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and as a contract player he, you know, played a bunch of bit parts, wasn't very successful. They traded yeah. him off to to other studios finally he's like i'm not working at all so he went over and started working at warner brothers as a grip and what? yep and he was working as a wow. grip for a while and then he fell off some scaffolding on a movie shoot and went well i don't want to do this anymore so he quit <laughs> that work decided to go to acting school ends up at mgm then gets traded to rko which is why he ends up playing an uncredited role in citizen kane yeah um because he's one of the reporters oh, um, get the, what he's in the room he's in the room wow, yeah he's the guy awesome. he's the guy with a pipe that you see in silhouette <laughs> that's alan Lyle. Oh, i think i think that's who awesome. that is and then world war ii happens and he joins mm-hmm. the army he joins the army air force in their motion picture unit gets a medical discharge for stomach issues and then his career really happens post world war ii yeah he's in he's in the great gatsby uh, and he's got one more movie on his contract at Paramount, and that's how he ends up getting this gig. He, well, Alan Ladd, uh, you know, was not known to be a, you know, he wasn't considered a great actor, but he was, you know, it had done really films that really worked and were impressive, and he he was impressive, and and he was just sort of the right man for this part, and uh, they worked very well together. And a tragic ending for the man. Yeah. Um, it's so ironic, all the success and what have you, but he was also someone who witnessed his mother's suicide to oh. from from rat po- or ant poison. Oh, and Jesus. she was apparently alcoholic, very uh, troubled woman. And as he's achieving all this success, obviously these issues might have popped up for him. Uh, and uh, a, a year or so before he was found dead from a combo of alcohol and sedatives, he was only 50 years old. Wow. He had shot himself near the heart. Oh my and god! They had fa- yeah, this. they had found him in a pool of blood, and they saved his life. But a year later, he died from that combo. So clearly, there was a lot going on for this man that wasn't addressed in his life. And when you watch Shane through that prism, now you can really understand in a visceral level what he's accessing in certain moments when he's having those quiet exchanges or the moments where he doesn't do anything and just kind of walks out of a room or whatever. There's so much happening underneath him. Well, that's why it's such a subtle, it's such a subtle Mm. movie. We don't mind my cutting through your place. And now we get to meet Van Heflin. No, I guess not. I'll ask you the same question. Would you like (laughs) to know who they originally wanted for this role? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe that was Gary Cooper. No, who, who was Van, who was Van Heflin? William Holden. William Holden. Ah, yeah, that makes so- William Holden and Montgomery Clift. That's interesting. I would actually switch those two to be honest with you it, it, for the roles that they were looked at for. Mm. Wow, interesting. Okay. I, I mean, I love William Holden. I, I think yeah. William Holden is a more interesting actor than Van Heflin, mm. but I but I can't argue with this film. You know, it's this film is what it is. Um, I think he would have eclipsed uh, uh, Alan Ladd, which is why you cast someone like Van Heflin. He never takes the screen attention away from Alan Ladd. It's been a long time since I've seen a Jersey cop. And I guess this is because Jersey, I don't know this. So all the ranchers and cow people out there can certainly correct me. But I think the implication is that this, the Jersey cow is one that would be to homestead, not Mm -hmm. the kind of cattle you would take on a big cattle drive. Because... Heflin is saying, oh, you're going to see a lot more of them. They're going to be a lot mm-hmm. more of these small farms than there was in the past. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then there's this moment where the kid, as he's going to get a drink of water, the kid cocks his rifle. Mm-hmm. And Shane spins and turns with a quick draw. <laughs> and it is scary. It is scary. Because that kid is a, 
a, a millisecond away away from getting killed. Once again, right? It shows you this moment in a western where you see the exchange for being this legendary gunfighter. Someone is always trying to beat you, and you never know who's coming for you. So you have to always be ready at any moment and jump at anything with the hand on your pistol. You know, uh, Magnificent Seven did a great job having totally. that back and forth, with right? Robert so, Vaughn, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, even within, and people talk about the neo Western and all that stuff. And it's like, well, yes, but people within Westerns in the 50s and 60s were questioning the genre within the genre itself. Didn't mean they were overall neo Westerns, but that idea of questioning of, of what a legend is, what an icon is, and what a gunfighter is, and the exchange for it has been happening all throughout the genre. And this is another it, it, moment. It's so funny doing this show with you has really turned me around on this whole question because it, in my brain it used yeah. to be like you know kind of what you're you know the neo western thing that there was the good guy bad guy black hat white hat westerns and mm. then we got the spaghetti westerns where we got these darker stories and mm -hmm. and, and and Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid where we got you know where we put spun the way the west works and now having done like you and I did High Noon we yeah. did the Searchers and doing this it's like. The Searchers is dark. Like the Searchers oh, yeah. is, you know, and this has darkness to it. This is complexity yeah. to it. High Noon mm -hmm. is all about, yeah, Gary Cooper's a good guy, but it's all about this town turning on him and cowardice yeah. and all this. And it's like, no, it was all there. There was yeah. no time. I mean, yes. Mm -hmm. Are there good guy, bad guys, Westerns? And yeah, totally. Tons and tons of them. Mm -hmm. But it's not like they weren't making movies like this. That's why it's crazy when people talk about it. it's American, American. It's the best of America. I'm like, are you? Do you see what Americans are doing in these movies? It's the hero is the one that's standing up against all the madness of it all. The other Americans are cowering or turning on him in High Noon, uh, or in, in the Searchers. You, you're having someone who who is uh, essentially a racist trying to save his daughter and says some terrible things, and they're shutting the door on him because they want to shut away that past. So there's so much happening. People revere the westerns. But they forget that what's actually happening in the Westerns is an indictment sometimes of how a, a mob can think or how Americans can think about certain things. Uh, and they feel topical no matter when you watch them, because that still happens today. Mm -hmm. Well, and to be clear, we don't know who Shane is. Yeah, we, we don't, don't know what he's done in the past. At this point, we have no idea. Yeah. Well, we never find out. We, well, that's we true. Know, we don't we, never find out. We know he's a gunslinger. Out. He could yes. have been a, as bad a guy as Wilson. We literally yeah. don't know. Mm -hmm. Um you know, and the, the other thing to, to put this frame on top of it is mm -hmm. what George Stevens felt coming back from the war. And what one of the things he said or one of the things his son said about it is that he had seen what real bullets did. One oh. real bullet. He saw that. And mm -hmm. then he comes back after World War Two and sees, you know, guys like John Wayne using, you know, six guns like their guitars. They yeah. just play with them, that they're toys. And that they're heroic and exciting. And so yeah. he wanted to reframe that with Shane. And this is the thing, too. You could very easily say Shane is a person with PTSD. Oh, absolutely. You know? Oh, absolutely. Yes. So him yes. drawing that gun on the kid at this moment, mm -hmm. this is a person who is, you know, they, what, everything they say about PTSD is you have yeah. a moment and it activates. It takes you back to that time. Yep. You know? Yep. The loud um, noise or whatever gets you there. Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Joey, you know better than to point guns at people. I wasn't pointing at anybody, Mother. And now we get to meet Mom, yeah, which is, as you said, Jean Arthur. She hadn't made a movie in five years before this. Yeah, bro. Yeah. She's she had 50, kind of, she, yeah. she kind of lost her faith in it. She, she really yeah. was kind of done with the system. Well, and she's 50 years old, which I would have mm -hmm. never thought she's 50 in this film. Yeah. And she was gray, a gray-haired little lady who cared, cared deeply about animals and mm. safety for animals. And she was always very attentive to the animals on the set. And, and the dad, of course, had worked with her on uh, The More the Merrier. Right. He loved working with her. And, and she was just enchanting. And this was so a very different kind of part. Yeah. He, he thought she could bring a quality he wanted to that film. Well, there's so, there's so much of her performance that's just in the looks. It's not in the dialogue. It's just how she, you know, how she looks at Shane. The and you could see there's so much going on that that we never express. Yeah. I just wanted to see my rifle, but you can shoot. 
right from the beginning, this mm -hmm. kid is idolizing Shane. Yes. Right from the beginning. And then we hear a loud call and the music suddenly gets serious and dad picks up the rifle and says, Looks like your friends are a little late. And because we see a bunch of other cowboys riding up and these are the Riker boys. Yeah. And, and dad thinks, Joe thinks that Shane is just one of them. He's one of the bad guys. I wouldn't know a Riker from your Jersey cop. Don't forget to close the gate on your way out. And he's got his gun now aimed at Shane, who says, Do you mind putting down that gun? Then I'll leave. What difference does it make you leaving anyway? And I love this re response because he says, I'd like it to be my idea. <laughs> you know, so he's giving him. So you, immediately we were, although we don't know where Shane came from, Steve, as you mentioned, and, and rightfully point out, and we don't know his past or whatever. We sense that he's a good man. He's not wearing white right. as the standard. He's wearing the kind of yellow buckskin stuff, but he's seen, but the, but the interactions and the way he's treating everybody with respect. And even in this moment, even after the, he's been like all kind of hopped up on that sound, he doesn't immediately reach for his gun when, uh, when uh, Joe grabs his and points it at him. And that's cause he's like, I'm going to, you know, let me just put the thing down. I'm going to take off, but I want it to be my idea. Cause if it's not my idea, we're going to have a standoff. And it's so it's it just lets you know the good person you're dealing with here. Well, and I, I would put it, I, I would say, I, I think all that's true. And I also mm. think that there, it reminds me, I don't know, in, in Les Miserables, Jean Valjean is a convict. Yeah. And the label of, you know, 24601 mm -hmm. follows him where he goes and he can't everywhere he goes to a new town. Everyone immediately knows that he's a convict yeah. and they all judge him that way because that label goes with him. And what I mm -hmm. see happening in this moment is that here Shane, who has been labeled elsewhere yeah. as a gunslinger, has come to a new place. And in the first moments, he already yeah. feels a label on him. Yeah. He, he's like, I can't go anywhere and not be a bad guy. It's like mm -hmm. my past comes with me, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and there's real, real sadness. Mm -hmm. And he heads out and these writers come in. And, and one of the things, by the way, Westerns, traditionally in Hollywood had had costume designers design costumes for the Western. <laughs> yeah. And George Stevens definitely didn't want that. He wanted real beat up work clothes that people really have lived in. And that shows in every moment, you know, yeah. Yeah. there's nothing romanticized about the, the way these people look, they look like they've been out working on the homestead. Yeah. I got that thief contract for the reservation. Did it take this many of you to tell me that? I mean, business. Then you tend to your own. That's just what I'm doing. I'm telling you now, I'm going to need all my range. Now that you've warned me, would you mind getting off my place? Your place! And things are starting to get tense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You're going to have to get out before the snow flies. And supposing I don't? You and the other squatters. Homesteaders, you mean, don't you? And this is this term we're going to hear, is that for the ranchers, these guys are squatters. And they say they're homesteaders. That's yeah. a very different idea. I could blast you out of here right now. So they're in the midst of this standoff. They're yeah. right about to open fire, it feels like. Mm -hmm. Joe is totally outmatched. And then out from behind the house, suddenly Shane is standing behind him, which he doesn't yeah. know. Right. That's great. Yeah. And there's a, there's a composure to him that immediately mm -hmm. conveys... You don't want to be doing this. You don't yeah. want to mess around. He's so cool and calm when he steps out yep. from behind there. Yeah. Who are you, stranger? I'm a friend of Starts. And they go, okay. And they back down. Mm -hmm. uh, and he says, all right, you told me. Now get off my claim. And by the way, the, the fact that the horses ride over his vegetable garden is just one more little yeah. insult going yeah. on. Marion, which is uh, Gene Arthur, says supper will be ready in a little while. And Shane starts to head off. Wait, mister, I, I swear, I, wait a minute, please. And Joe apologizes, because he's a good guy. Yeah. You know, yeah. he realizes he misjudged this guy. I, I take that back what I, <laughs> well, look, this, this thing ain't even loaded. And he now invites him to come in for dinner and offers his hand. And we hear, call me Shane. Mm -hmm. Does Shane have a first name? Uh, I, I don't know. Uh, I just I don't know think Shane. So. Yeah. Yeah. He's just Shane. He's a he's one name Shane. dude. <laughs> um, and by the way, you want to know who they were considering for Marion? Ooh, Barbara Stanwyck. That would be great. But no, yeah. every one of these people are very different. Catherine mm -hmm. Hepburn, 
Jesus, that's a completely different movie. Oh right? My God. Montgomery the- Clift, William Holden, and Catherine Hepburn? <laughs> that's a whole other movie, man. You know, we're dealing with multiverses in the yeah. superhero films now. I would yeah. love to deal with family. I mean, a film oh multiverses. My God. You know, the to Greek- create that. Yeah. Would it be so cool to watch the Tom Selleck Raiders of the Lost Ark to watch? Listen, they're doing mo- They're doing deep fakes, right? The deep right. fake technology is just by leaps and bounds has grown in the last two or three years. At some point, you're going to be, and you know, they've got that James Dean movie supposedly coming where they're putting James Dean in the movie. Oh, Jesus. This may happen down the road where we're able, if we have enough money or somebody has enough money, to do a version of the film with the intent, with the original actors that they went to, to see what it would look like, you know? So Beverly Hills cop with Sylvester Stallone. Come on. Yeah. There's, there's some interesting things to play around with for sure. And don't forget the Eric Stoltz uh, back to the future. Yeah. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's a way more darker film than you think, man. <laughs> um, and we sit down to supper and there are two things going on sort of in the subtext of this scene. The first thing going on is Joey, the kid, is obsessed with mm. the six guns. With the, He immediately has an image of who he thinks Shane is yeah. that excites him. And the other thing, and this is what we're going to have to talk about throughout the film, is there something going on with Marion and Shane. Yeah, yeah. One of the choices that Stevens made is that she becomes more feminine as the film goes on. Hmm. So when we meet her, she's wearing just pants and work clothes and that's just it. But as soon as Shane arrives, she slowly changes her appearance. Yeah. And that is uh, something real interesting in this movie. I I do want to say something. Can we stop for a second and talk about Gene Arthur? I know we we mentioned it a little bit in in, uh, Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. Sure, years um, ago, yeah. Yeah, but this is, I mean, Gene Arthur is such an interesting and complex woman, a woman who was very much an introvert, yet became Mm. a star in Hollywood. And she left at the height of her prime in 1944, only did two more films after that. And this is one of them. And then they brought her back in the 60s to do the Gene Arthur show, but it only lasted 11 weeks. Uh, she was uh, apparently she she taught at Vassar and North Carolina uh, College mm. School for the Arts. She taught a young Meryl Streep when she was a junior drama student. Uh, and so she and she said when she saw her on screen on a uh, stage doing Miss Julie that she had the uh, she had she was watching a movie star. And so she knew even ahead of time before Meryl wow. Streep became what she became. And this is a woman who kind of shied away from everything with Hollywood. She said she hated Hollywood. It just drove her nuts, especially those people who were trying to get information on her all the time. It just wasn't her deal. And um, apparently there was a, a, a retrospective on her back in the 70s uh, there with Capra. And they did an interview with her while she was there. At the, I can't remember what school it was at. And they were going to screen one of the films that she was in with Capra. And Cap and Capra begged her to stay. And she said she couldn't stay. She had to go home and feed her cats. And so this is, um, a, yeah, she was, clearly you could tell this is a woman that had a certain approach to film and certain approach to becoming an actress. And even back then, uh, you know, because she had success playing these characters, but she said a majority of her early success, she was playing these vapid ingenues and, and she wanted more. So she sensed that there was some, she had this drive to create different kind of characters. The problem was that she was also very sensitive and she called herself, I'm a sensitive backwards child, unless I'm on a set. When I'm on a set that I'm with other people and we get lost in the world of the movie. When I'm off the set, I'm very much not, my own person and she said the i think the reason i became an actress is because i didn't want to be myself and so wow. just you see this kind of stuff and sometimes this 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 business will chew up and spit out people who are not ready to handle the rigors of what it is to be an actress and we lose out on it because we don't get a chance to enjoy their talent uh in more projects because the grind of a press conference or, or doing press for the film or being interviewed or having gossip columnists, columnists or paparazzi go and find them. That's the unfortunate uh, side part of being a successful actor. You know, you have to deal with all this nonsense even back then, you know, and so it's such a shame. And at one point in her career, bro, she was making more money than the president of the United States. Wow. Uh, she had made $118,000 a year. This, this is a woman making $118,000 a year back in the 30s you know so this is not someone who left because hollywood didn't want her anymore she left at the height of her fame in in 1944 it's so sad because it sounds like if you just had the acting part to show up on the set and do the job yeah she's great 
Yeah. And it's all the other crap. That's the problem. It's like, uh, and I know you, you, you know much more about this than me, but it's, it's, uh, it's Marshawn Lynch, right. Who, who yeah. like refused to do or messed with press conferences yes. and just in the NFL. Like, yeah. yeah. And it's like, for I, that makes perfect sense to me. It's yeah. like, yeah. look, you're hiring me to play football. Mm-hmm. You're hiring me to act in this movie. Like, why do yeah. I have to do? And of course you and I both know you do have to do all that other stuff, particularly as an actor. Yeah. Uh, like I just yeah. heard, uh, Will Smith interviewed cause he's got mm. the movie coming out and he's got a book coming out. Yeah. King and Richard, I think it was yeah. on, yeah. And I think it was on, uh, the daily show is that he, I forget who he said he was talking to, uh, but he was talking to an actor just when he was coming up who told mm-hmm. him, you gotta, you gotta sign every autograph. You gotta go to every press event. You have to be like a politician. And then he met tom cruise who he said was the best at this and he said okay i'm gonna out tom cruise tom cruise and then he realized he couldn't because nobody like tom cruise nobody never stops yes he has an engine like nobody ever yeah uh and that's just you know and of course this is stuff that i'm i'd be like gene arthur i can't i couldn't handle that kind of stuff you know i'm an introvert it would be brutal one more uh, yeah sorry sorry, go ahead good no no, one more thing thing about mr smith uh is that Mm -hmm. we all everyone talks about jimmy stewart's performance which is great I think yeah. Gene Arthur makes that movie. Oh my God. Yeah. A thousand percent. Yeah. She makes that movie. Yeah. Yeah. Because, because, because Jimmy Stewart is the bumbling, I don't know what's going on guy. And you have Mr. Skeptic, uh, uncle Billy, who's the skeptic on the other side. Right. She's the one that walks the line between them both. And yep. yeah, she's essential to that. I fell in love with her in that movie. Me too. Which is, which is why I am so obsessed with her because um, she was so damn good in that movie. And to see that, she just didn't want to do more because of the grind of Hollywood is heartbreaking, man. Cause we, we miss out on that, you know? And I, and I, I wish there was a way to stop that so that more people could be, uh, could stay in the system and, and, and do great work and create legendary characters and legendary films for us to enjoy and keep the medium, uh, you know, el- expanding and elevating. It, it would yeah. be great, but you know, sadly Agreed. it's not Agreed. the truth. There's a noise while they're having supper. And again, he's ready to draw. He's ready to go for a gun. Yeah. And, and, and what's so great, no one comments on it, is they all see it. Right. They understand it. And they kind of accept who this guy is. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? And, and Van Heflin's being real uh, gentle about asking questions. He doesn't ask yeah. where he's coming. He even says, I wouldn't ask you where you're bound. Which is a way, it's a funny way of asking someone without asking, by the way. I wouldn't yes. ask you this. Yeah. One place or another. Some place I've never been. I love that line. It's a great line. And it it so sets up what this part of this movie is about. Because part of this movie is him trying to find a place that he fits in. And these people who are ready to defend to the death the place that they have found. Because Van Heflin says, I know one thing. The only way they're going to get me out of here is in a pine box. What do you mean, Pa? He says that in front of his son. Well, I mean, son, you'll have to shoot me and carry me out. I mean, could you imagine your dad saying... <laughs> realistically like they're gonna have to carry me out in a pine box yeah yeah you know when you're a little kid and and the harsh truth of it all right you know and here you are playing with your guns and shoot you know looking to shoot an elk and here's the reality of the situation and he keeps insisting like what does this mean what does this mean if i could hire me a man that had one once but rack of brothers roughed him up a bit so he lit out cussing me they knocked his teeth out and then out comes the pie. Yeah. And th- again, these are the little subtle moments that I didn't see when I was younger. Say, we're kind of fancy, aren't we? What is, Bob? Our good plates and extra fork. Why did she put out the nice plates? Because there's something about her and Shane. As, as you point out, the subtlety of that relationship between Marion, the wife of Joe Starrett, and Shane is so extraordinary and delicate. Um, and that really is kind of my father's touch. You know, he had yeah. this insight. I mean, you've just been discussing giant. You see the subtlety of those uh, relationships, and he really knew how to tease those out. And, and 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 as you again pointed out in your discussion, with with great subtlety. Yeah. yeah. And it starts right just as. Joey, the moment he sees Shane has a feeling, emotional feeling about this guy, mm-hmm. so does Marion. Yeah. Right from the yeah. beginning. And it's ironic, isn't it, Steve, throughout the movie? Because she tells Joe to not go into town and use his guns. And not, I mean, 
what do you think she was going to get with Shane? Even though she was kind of, you could argue she was finding herself attracted to him throughout the movie. Shane would have been a way harder situation for her to get into for her life. But there's something about him, the confidence, his ability to handle a situation. Once again, this happens in Pale Rider. I think Pale Rider is very much an yeah. homage to uh, Shane. There is so much unspoken understanding in this film all around, mm-hmm. you know, and it and it's what's so weird about it is that it's never in a you never don't like Marion or Shane. Oh, sure. Or, you know, for any of right. this. Right. You just right. go, oh, right. there's something there. That, that was an elegant dinner, Mrs. Stein. Excuse me. He goes out. Where's Mr. Shane going? Didn't even say goodbye. No, he's not going, Joy. He wouldn't go without taking that. Because he had taken his gun off and he'd left it inside. Yeah. And that is symbolic. Mm -hmm. I have taken off my gun. (laughs) Um, And they look out the window and what is he doing? He's chopping on that damn tree stump stump. that Paul was working on. (laughs) I'll be doggone. Come here, man. Then we cut to, and this is awesome. The two guys working together yep. to get this, you know, stump out of the ground. And it's mm-hmm. such a joyful moment. And, you know, we talked for years about show, don't tell. This is such a show, don't tell. We yeah. never, he never said, hey, I want you to work for me. He never said, I want to work for me. He just never said, like, I've been a wanderer all my life. And I, you talked about putting down roots and I feel mm-hmm. something for you. All of those things that are happening aren't said. Yeah, the deceptive truth about this movie is that um, this is also Shane's story. Like, there's a whole nother movie that is from Shane's perspective, which is he is he knows, and he says this later on in the film, the difference is I know my time is coming in terms of the end of his days as a gunslinger, right? right? This is a man at a crossroads. And so he comes upon this town, happens upon this family who's very nice. They take him in, they feed him. And here he is chopping. I, this is him going through the process of, can I put down my guns? Yes. Can I live in a world without being a gunslinger? Can I make it a go? And of course, later on in the film, near the end, when he, he says a man can't change who he is, Joey, all of that. So he tried it out. He wanted to be a homesteader. He said, you know, he even bought the clothes. We're getting to that where he buys the clothes of the homesteader to play the homesteader. Yeah. And in the end... When he come when he goes and confronts the uh, Riker and his crew and Jack Palance, he's back in the buckskin, and that's him shedding the clothes of the homesteader because he tried it. It's not for him. As much as he'd like to do it, his impulse to fight will never leave him. And he's I think he's more at peace by the end of the movie uh, than he is when he shows up at the beginning of the movie. I, I think so too. I think you know it's so interesting because, like I've said, that Joey and uh, Marion and really Joe Van mm. Heflin as well. They all have an idea of who this guy Shane is, and right. he becomes not a father figure for Joey, not a lover for Marion. Right. Definitely, I would say a brother for Joe. Yeah, but like, like immediately welcomed into the family. And I think mm-hmm. the opposite is happening too. I think Shane looks at them and he falls in love with this family. Yes, and he and he falls in love with the idea of this family, Absolutely. and he falls in love with the idea of who he could be mm-hmm. if he was with this family. Yep, you know. Like Even the dance with Marion at Marion's own wedding is him yeah. sampling the possibility of being married and settling down and having roots. Yeah. Yep. Um, and I love the moment where they say, well, why don't you hook the team up? You've, you know, you've cut away at this <laughs> stuff. Why don't you hook, get some oxen and pull this thing out? And Van Heflin says, Marion, I've been fighting this stump off and on for two years. There's a team now and this stump could say it beat us. Sometimes there ain't nothing it'll do but your own sweat and muscle which i think a is dumb and b <laughs> is awesome yeah absolutely ha, but ha, have you ever uh had to pull a stump out of the ground uh y- no but matt nost on the top 10 mm-hmm. we spent about 20 minutes talking about him uh taking a stump out of the ground that took him like two weeks to take out of the ground uh at a place that he has and it was just funny he sent pictures and everything it is massive these things so no yeah. i've never done that have you <laughs> Yeah, when uh, in Boy Scouts, we were like building a trail. <laughs> and you do these things, they're like, when you become an Eagle Scout, you have to do a project. And so this yeah. was someone's Eagle Scout project, not mine. And I remember, and we had like chainsaws. And I mean, wow. it, yeah, it is a big thing. And it was like 12 of us tied <sighs> onto this trunk but after we'd cut away, because you got to cut away all the roots first. It's yeah. a big damn job. Yes. 
And, and this is like a dramatic, heroic moment as they succeed in getting the, the trunk out. It's the next morning. Joey wakes up, sees the elk. He's moving in on him, grabs his rifle. I wish they'd give me some bullets for this gun. Because he wants to shoot stuff. Yeah. And that's going to get to a place later in this film that is probably the most intense scene in the movie for me. Yeah, the bang bang scene. Yeah, yeah, the bang bang scene. Mm-hmm. And Shane is lying down. He's got his hat over his head. He's in the hay. Joey comes in and talks about breakfast that she's going to take. And Joey says, "I wish you'd stay here. Would you teach me to shoot? So you'd like to learn to shoot, huh? I wish you'd stay too. I heard him tell mother." We need to go to town, get some wire to build a fence, mm-hmm. and that Shane is going to run the errand because he's going to stay. And I don't think, yeah. does he ever actually say, I am going to stay? To no, them? I don't think so. No, I, I don't, don't think, think so either. Yeah. What can I bring you, Joey? Soda pop. And he gets into the wagon, and Joey says, aren't you going to wear your six-shooter, Mr. Shane? I didn't know there was any wild game in town, Joey. And he rides off. How hard do you think it was for Shane to not take his guns. Yeah. I, I don't know. It's a good question. Um, I'm sure it was hard, but then by the same token, he is exploring this possibility. So I'm sure there were moments where he's just like, ugh. Uh, you know, let me ask the question a in a different way. Yeah, yeah okay. let me ask the question in a different way, because I agree. Mm-hmm. When was the last time he went anywhere without his gun? I can't. I, I probably has been years. That's what I think, too. Those guns. I think yeah. it's been years. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, you're right. I think he feels naked. The shots are incredible. It's such yeah. a beautiful film. The images, like the John Ford images of Monument Valley is so Ooh. iconic in terms of Westerns. I think the images in Shane are, are equally iconic of a right. different sort of location. But the, the you know, those Tetons that are in the background of those shots is just absolutely beautiful. And, and Steve, if you look at some other films, I, I saw one recently that's been shot up in that part of Jackson Hole. Mm-hmm. My father you know, started out as a cameraman. Uh, but he'd grown up in the theater, but his parents were actors. So he had this sense of theater and story. But his first jobs were as a camera. He photographed most of the great Laurel and Hardy films. Right. The lenses used in Shane, that those Tetons, he, he shot them with long lenses. So they loomed, you know, right. rather than flattening out. It, yeah. it, pair them with other film shot there. And, uh, you know, the, he had that town built right in front of them and they they were overseeing the little story we were telling. So we've talked about lensing and how, like in Citizen Kane, you use a wide lens, which creates huge size changes. So you have something up close is, will be huge and someone 10 feet behind them, you could see their whole body and that it, th- those 10 feet look really distant because yeah. of those huge size changes. Yep, so, exactly. George Stevens wanted you to see the landscape, the Grand Tetons, which are gorgeous. Right. And so he did the opposite, which is this is all shot in long lenses because that way it actually compresses space. So wide Mm -hmm. lenses make everything look really far apart. If you did this in a wide lens, the Grand Tetons would be tiny, tiny, tiny little mountains way in the background. Because he's shooting this in long lenses, the Tetons look huge and they look really close to Mm -hmm. our characters. Yeah. And what that means too, though, is that that means that they were the camera was probably 20, 30 feet away from what it was shooting in order to have these in fo- all in focus yeah. uh, with the yeah. long lens and to have the size right. Pa, you get Shane will teach me to shoot. <laughs> I love this because that's an immediate like, dude, <laughs> she don't say, that's your dad. Can you shoot as good as Shane, Pa? How do I know? I've never seen him shoot. But I doubt it. Which I love that because Van Heflin has seen who this guy is. And a guy with a cart rides in. This is Ernie. Uh, and Ernie is ready to go. He's another <laughs> homesteader. And he's like, I'm out of here. I'm wore down and out. Tired of being insulted by them fellas. Called a pig farmer. Well, who knows what comes next? Well, don't throw your tail up. I tell you what. We'll all get together right here tonight and we'll, we'll figure out something. And this is it. This is his role. His role is yeah. he is the guy keeping the homesteaders together. All right, I'll tell him. 
But if we're going to have a meeting, it better come to more than just poking holes in the air with your finger. I love that when he says that. I, do I too. love that. Because, right? Because we see that all the time. Twitter is poking your whole exactly. your fingers in the air, you know, and I'm guilty of it. I, I in no way I'm casting, uh, you know, going after anybody on Twitter. I'm just saying that is Twitter overall. And I've participated in the finger pointing in the air as well. And it's just like, it's part of it. Yeah. So yeah. Again, well, and I've, I've certain, yeah. 1953, I've certainly, 2021. Yeah. yeah. I've certainly been in the meeting where at the end you go, yeah, someone should do something. This is really important. Okay. We're all agreed. Someone should do something. <laughs> yes. And then you, and you go and leave the meeting and nobody does anything. <laughs> we arrive at the store. Again, this is in the middle of nowhere, and they built this whole town for the movie. Wow. wow. Yeah, no, there was nothing here. This is empty. He goes into the store, and immediately you're, we're nervous, right? Yeah. yeah. Like, you just feel like, oh, shit, he doesn't have his gun, and yeah. their people, their looks. You knew? Yes, I'm working for Stark. Got any ready-made pants that might fit me? Primary? Mm-hmm. Oh, I outfit all these farmers. And Shane comes out in those store bought clothes, looking like a farmer. A homestead. Yeah, a farmer. A homesteader. Homesteader. Yeah, 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 exactly. So, by the way, he asks how much money it is, and the guy calculates it, and he says it's two dollars and two bits. And apparently, that was a big laugh moment in the movie theater because in 1953, that was ridiculously cheap for clothes. And what you know, what's funny is that joke always works. Yeah, you know, yep, wherever yep. you are, when someone <laughs> says the price of something in the past, we all laugh. Um, <laughs> Now we start to hear the insults. Oh, new sodbuster, huh? I thought I smelled pigs. And then he asks about some soda. You got any soda pop? I sure do. I wish more men around here drink it. <laughs> yeah. So he goes into the bar, and man, more insults. Let's keep the smell of pigs out from where we're drinking. And we can see what this scene is. This is the... I'm not going to rise to the insults and get in a fight. I'm yep. going to try to stay peaceful. And this one guy, Chris Calloway, mm -hmm. is going to keep pushing it. Uh, and this is uh, Ben Johnson, who is a, yeah, tons of stuff, John Ford movies. Yeah, the great Ben Johnson, who's in Wild Bunch and, like you said, a number of other films. Uh, it's so great to see him as a young man in this movie. That's just what's great about watching these older westerns. You can see the beginnings of these right. young guys, you know, Lee Van Cleef in fricking uh, Liberty balance, you know, there's right, this, all right. these, you see these little moments where you get to know these guys before they became big. Yeah. Well, uh, and by, by the way, uh, Ben Johnson is six, three. <laughs> Alan Ladd is five, seven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. To make this ring work. Yeah, make this thing work. <laughs> that's a lot. That's a, that's a big, big difference. Uh -huh. Well, well, let be lemon, strawberry or lilac sod buster. You speaking to me. I don't see nobody else standing there. I never realized that that is what Taxi Driver, that's what Robert De Niro is quoting in, in front of the mirror. Oh, yeah. Yeah, right. When he says, you're talking to me, I don't see anybody else here. <laughs> I never knew that that was Shane. Yeah, yeah. Ah, I feel, now we have to go and redo the whole Taxi Driver <laughs> episode. Maybe just that scene. Maybe just <laughs> okay, maybe just, We could just punch in. <laughs> <laughs> flying in from 2021 here to say <laughs> we missed one thing that would be by the way that would be hilarious yeah to, that actually was a great is a great idea for short is just start going through okay what did we miss in this movie this 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 next one what do we miss yeah. in this movie yeah well our <laughs> listeners are very good at reminding us of the things we missed oh, we we, I know. we get and i love that we get we get like 90 five 96 percent of things right and then like the extra four percent someone's always like you forgot to mention this well what about this did you know this so it's always fascinating what one, one of the things they don't know is that there are times where i have it in my notes but our yeah. episode is going so goddamn long right, and right. you and i have to go to a you know a thing yeah or we're just hung yeah. or i have to pee and it's like <laughs> you know what it's okay yeah we'll skip that we'll one skip this we'll one skip. thing exactly yeah. <laughs> no you can't skip anything chris uh, ben Johnson grabs a drink and throws it right in Alan Ladd's chest. Here, have some of this. And his new shirt. And you know what? You know what else this is? This is like uh, Bruce Lee. You know, we talked about we just did our live show on Drunken yes. Master of yes. like, I'm not going to fight. I'm not going to fight. I'm going to yeah. just take it. Say, which one of them tater pickers are you working for? Or are you just squatting on the range? It's your start of sending your business. Supposing I make it my business. And there is a long, long look from Alan Ladd, and then he exits. Yeah. 
Um, one of the things Alan Ladd said he liked about George Stevens was he said he gave him time. Hmm. He just gave him the time to build the performance, which uh, you could really see here. Oh, absolutely. It's such a fantastic performance because of the time he has. In the, he fills the silences with so much in his eyes or in his little movements of his face or just a look. It's great. Well, I mean, and the reality is Shane barely says anything in this movie. Yeah, yeah, true. You know, most of his lines are a couple of words. Yeah. They're, there's no long speeches. Uh, we're back at Start's place, and it's pouring rain, and we've got a bunch of guys in there. By the way, this was apparently a cover set, so this is built mm. in a high school gym, this set. Oh, wow. And a okay. cover set is what you have, because in case you have weather, you always have a set you could go to that's inside. So if it starts raining outside, you can come shoot this, which is ironic since this is a rain scene, but apparently shot inside i guess we all know why we're here i guess riker's war parties have been around to see all of us i'm here to tell you for one that i ain't leaving now or any other time there's a harmonica guy playing which comes Hmm. crucial to the movie and apparently that just was an accident is that one of the actors (laughs) they brought in happened to play the harmonica and george stevens said that's great we'll use it and becomes a big part of the film how far is this Riker going to push it? Let's not talk scare. That's just exactly what Riker wants. He thinks he can just shoo us off of here like a flock of chickens. Well, here's Tori now. Here he Hello, is. Hello, Lem. Hello, Yank. And in walks Elijah Cook Jr., which for me will always be Rooster T. Cogburn, attorney at law from Court Martial, the episode of Star Trek. Yes. Now, yes. yeah, the, a discussion of which is now available on Enterprise Incidents. <laughs> and he plays Frank Stonewall Tory. Yeah. And yeah. he is clearly the town. He likes to drink. He's a bit of a blowhard. He is brave. He is aggressive. I love yes. that they cast a small guy to play this part. Yes. Um, and the harmonica guy kind of makes fun of him by playing something when he comes in. That's enough out of you, Yank. <laughs> you too. Uh, and then Shane comes in. And yes. what's interesting when Shane comes in is there's a reaction. Everyone's like, oh, I heard about you. Mm-hmm. Because the word that he got buffaloed out of the saloon has yeah. already spread around the valley. Of course, small town. Yeah. So they think he's a coward. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, we know he was brave enough to resist thrown down with this guy, mm-hmm. but his reputation is not good now. This is why Westerns and martial arts movies are always so intrinsically connected, man. Totally. From, you know, people talk about the Kurosawa stuff, you know, and John Ford, to John Ford, the partnership. You know, I got in trouble for that tweet I wrote years ago about Mandalorian a couple of years ago. But like, this is the thing in, in this situation yet again, right? We've seen in new, how many martial arts films? You know, quietly taking the abuse because they don't want to start any trouble or they've been told, please don't do this again. Please don't get into another fight. Please, you cause enough trouble when you get into these fights. Uh, but eventually the dam breaks and you have to fight. But there, And there's also a great thing with the audience where they actually respect the person because they have the other side of the story, right? And so the characters who are, who are, are calling him a coward or thinking he's a coward, they don't have the other side of the story. So we, in essence, are given a little bit of a special gift that we can connect to this character in this way because we know those stories. So we're even more in his camp or her camp when we're watching the townspeople react to that person. So it's, it's a brilliant technique in Westerns and martial art films. Well, and what's so hard about this one in particular is that mm-hmm. there's the moment where Start meets him and thinks he's one of the bad guys. And yeah. so there he's like labeled as bad guy, which he doesn't want. Right. And then right. And then he's having sort of the moments where he's about to draw, where he draws his gun or gets started by things and feels that they have labeled him and pegged him correctly as Mm -hmm. a gunfighter. Yeah. And so then he goes, well, I don't want to be that. So I'm going to take off my guns and I'm going to go to town. And even though all my instincts make me want to fight this guy, I'm going to resist that instinct to prove that I am not that. And what that proves to everyone else in town is that he's a coward. Yes. And so now in trying to uh, get rid of the label of gunfighter, he's taken on the label of coward. Yeah. Shane, you don't have to leave. I figured you could talk for you if I want to run. And we're in with Joey and Joey's just like, and mom and Joey's just like, well, for Shane couldn't have been afraid. And he opens up the window and we see Shane just standing out there in the rain. Shane, I know you ain't afraid. And then there is looks from Marion to Shane, 
and they are looks that are longer than they need to be. I'll put yeah. it that way. And what we hear playing on the harmonica is beautiful dreaming. Mm. <laughs> we're back in the meeting, and what they've decided is, look, we're going to go into town. If we're going to go into town, we'll all go together, and that way we'll be safe. I don't need no bodyguard. I'll put on my 38 and go into town anytime I please. And what does the harmonica play? He plays Dixie. Yeah. <laughs> because uh, Frank Stonewall Tory is a Southern. Yeah. Now, do you think he fought in the Civil War? Yeah, but I also think he didn't fight in the Civil War, if you know what well, I mean. I that's think a great question. Yeah. Yeah, I think he's one of these guys that was there but didn't actually fight because – or or somehow, you know – um came in at the tail end right when it was ending and didn't really see much war. Or if he did, he cowered away in the tent at the headquarters tent with the general. Like, that's what I think. Because nobody who's been to war like that, that has endured that kind of a war, I mean, it's the Civil War, is eager to get back into another battle. He's clearly trying to prove something. And his constant referencing of himself as some kind of you know, uh, badass uh, tells you all, completely that this guy never actually is. And he's been trying to prove it to himself yeah. and to everyone else around him. Um, and it's a tragic uh, flaw of his, as we see later on in the movie. Well, and I think, uh, and of course we, we don't know, but I think there might've been a specific incident of cowardice because it's also yes. the drinking. It's Great also point. the drinking is like, yes. cause he's an alcoholic. And yeah. so like, what's he, he's dealing with some stuff. Mm-hmm. Joey. Don't get to liking Shane too much. Is there anything wrong with him? No. Then what, Mother? You'll be moving on one day, Joey. You'll be upset. And I think she's telling herself that, too. I was just going to say, do you think she's really telling Joey that or herself that? So, yeah, yeah, absolutely. All the wagons are getting together and we're waiting on Marion. One thing a married man has got to get used to is waiting for women. Uh, and then she comes out looking in a dress now, looking much more feminine. Sometimes the waiting is worth it. Take care, Shane. You get a woman that's worth waiting for. And Shane is looking at his wife, you know, yeah. because really that's the woman he would like to get. In the yeah. fantasy, do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like he's he's like once again, he's just exploring the possibility of what this would be like. So he's yeah. allowing himself to like fantasize. And so is she. Right. The yep. idea of the uh, forbidden world, the idea of being with a gunslinger like Shane, there is a kind of temptation in that, a sexiness in that. And, it, you know, and it happens. And uh, um, I love that the film never fully dials into that. Whereas in Pale right. Rider, they do. I like that yeah. in this film, they don't. And it's just kind of bubbling below the surface. And I don't know if I recall if Van Heflin catches it. I mean, I think there's a moment Oh, he, he does. Maybe he has a passing. Th- is it at the wedding that he starts to kind of look at it a little weirdly, or is it? He basically all but says it later yeah. on in the film. I right. mean, that's what's so crazy about this movie to me, and that's where mm-hmm. I go like, oh, this. Yes, this is a movie about a gunslinger who comes to town and he saves the you know the homesteaders yeah. and fights against the bad guy and fights the big other gunslinger. It's all totally there, but it's right. all these looks and <laughs> things that are really interesting. And what yeah. just occurred to me is that this movie is so much about identity. Is that I yeah. identify as the rancher, and that is who yeah. I am. Yeah. I identify as the homesteader, and my home defines me. Like, yeah. And that's why I will die rather than give up this home. And Shane, who is identified as a gunslinger, is, as you say, toying with the idea of being this other thing. Yeah. That's what's so mm-hmm. interesting to me. Yeah. Um, anyway, we ride off. Every time we head to town, we hear thunder. <laughs> It's ominous. It's ominous. Yeah. We head into the store and Shane is kind of out on the boardwalk outside of the store. We see Ben Johnson's there mm-hmm. and we hear from our guys in the bar who apparently don't have jobs. Like no. apparently these guys are just always hanging out in this bar. <laughs> a whole bunch came in. They brought all our women with them to protect them. <laughs> and we watch some shopping and we're looking at the Sears catalog and Joey yeah. has his empty bottle of soda pop and goes up to the store owner and says, do I get the same thing for the empty as usual gets a nice piece of candy he asks what do i do with the bottle he says take it to the bar oh, yeah, you let me take it in and and, and when the wonderful beginning of the scene shane walks in bringing back a bottle of soda pop that he mm-hmm. bought in in the saloon his first time there and ben johnson had ridiculed him for buying soda pop 
Why do you think he does this? I mean, he walked away from this. Now he's instigating it. So why do you think he does this? Because of the scene with the ranchers, with the, with the homesteaders, yeah. uh, because of the meeting, because they all yeah. think he's a coward. Right. He's just kind of prove himself in, in this situation. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I think. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, absolutely. Because he starts this fight. Yes, he does. That's what I'm saying. We watching it the first time, you kind of respect the fact that he walks away from it. But now walking back in with a soda pop, he is, in essence, going back in there to reclaim his honor almost yep. and to go toe to toe with these people and maybe even send a message like, don't mess with these homesteaders. Look, pig farmer, you better get back inside with the women and kids where it's safe. Don't push it, Callaway. By the way, Callaway, Callaway and Tori are very similar. Mm. Because Callaway's the first one to jump up. Callaway's the first one to mouth off. Callaway's the first one. And I think Callaway's trying to prove something himself to these guys that he works with. Mm. And he's an interesting little subplot in the film. His arc is really nice in the yeah. film as well. And in the butt kicking that he's about to get, he realize maybe he spends the, f- the rest of the film in nonverbal looks, slowly changing his opinion on the Riker situation. So it's very interesting. So yeah. Well, one of the things, and this was cut out of the film mostly, but you'll notice there's certain looks between uh, Ben Johnson's character and this young woman. Yeah. And oh, there's a subplot. Oh, yeah, Sarah or whatever her name is. Yeah, yeah. right. And I think she might be Tori's daughter, but I'm not 100% sure. Oh, um, shit. I but there's a subplot that. where they have a relationship, and it's that relationship which is what motivates the turn at the end of the really? film. Really? But then, then that got cut out. Okay. Or at least the Stevens cut. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> um oh, the sarah cut. release the sarah cut <laughs> yeah set him up bartender two whiskeys you bought me a drink the last time i was in here now i want to buy you one he gets the drink you ain't gonna drink that in here you guessed it whiskey right in the face followed up with a big punch first on the clothes and the second one on the face then the punch yeah. So he doubled up on the whiskey. By the way, so watching this fight, it is so clear to me that the guy who directed this directed Giant because this is so oh, much yeah. like the fight in the diner. Yes. It, it's the big dude haymaker American style long <laughs> fight, you know? Right. But I also like that both get in shots. Like oh, it's yeah. not a one-sided fight, which is the not cliche in a lot of these films in the, some of the Westerns is, is the cliches, the, the, you know, the gun, the gunslinger totally has the, the uh, jump on all of them all the time, physically or with his gun. And I liked it here. Callaway Callaway is maybe a couple, uh, one or two strikes away from possibly getting the upper hand here. It isn't like um, Shane wipes the floor with him. Shane nope. eventually goes on a run at the end here and gets the best of him, but it isn't easy. And uh, Callaway gives as good as he gets for a majority of that fight. Well, that's why it reminds me of the fight in Giant, where they're just, I mean, mm-hmm. there's a lot of getting hit on yeah. both parts, and you don't know who's going to win. You really you know? don't. Right. Uh, it, which it, is a great for the audience, yeah. Each of those, there, there's a drama. You guys were discussing it, the development of the fight in Giant, which becomes critical to the ending of the picture. You know, there are stages to that, and you point out, uh, one of you, that in that scene in Giant, there's a moment where where Rock Hudson lands a tremendous yeah. blow on this huge guy with a very amplified soundtrack on the hit, right. you know, and it gives uh, gives the audience the sense that he's coming back. And similarly in Shane, that you know, it's an eight minute scene right. with the story developing. Well, and in both cases, the the fight isn't there just, and this is the thing of you saying, treating the audience with respect is there are lots of movies and certainly lots of Westerns where the fight's there to be exciting. And that's yeah. not why this fight is here. This, yeah. I mean, it is exciting, but yeah. why it's there is because Shane didn't chose not to fight as he's trying to be this thing that he isn't, you know, and then there's the judgment from the other homesteaders. Oh, that he might be a coward. Yeah, but as you say, at the end, he gets a run in along the bar, just punching him down the bar. He goes down, (laughs) he starts to get up, he punches him again, and that is the end of the fight. Well, I think that fight scene in the saloon, I got it in my book, I think there are 136 cuts in an eight-minute scene. And it's not that it's cutty, but it's just 
the way of telling the story. That, that number may, it may be a little large, but many, many. Um, and, and having Brandon and Wilda there as the observer, you are right. really seeing that film through the boy's eyes. So kind of the outsized nature of it, it, it you, you kind of accept it. Um, but it's, uh, that was challenging. And we think that this is all going to be okay. You know, okay. He won. Riker is there. I could use a man like you. I'm working for start. Whatever he's paying, I'll double. It's no use. What are you looking for? Nothing. And then Riker says, Pretty wife starts, guy. That's the line, man. And he says, yep. like, you, what, he says something, you dirty or whatever, you disrespectful, dirty. Why, you dirty, slinking old man? He bought our dues really talk to me that way. I'm talking to you that way. You had your chance, boy. I love that exchange. Um, Cause that guy has probably not been used to being put in his place in quite some time. So Shane doing it right there, hopped up after the victory is a great moment. Well, and because it's true. Yes. I mean, like, now I know, and, and this right. thing, That's it's an ambiguous that, movie. How yeah. much is his attraction to Marion? Why he's there working with start. I actually yeah. think, I think it's not the, as it's not everything. I think, no. right. I think he is worried Mm-hmm. that that is why he's doing it that yeah. uh, i think he worries about his motivation i think he mm-hmm. immediately loves that kid i think he yes. immediately feels connection with joe i think yeah. he cares about the homestead i think all of that's true but mm-hmm. also he's attracted to mary yes and this is where the scene turns mm-hmm. because now he's insulted the big boss and now a whole bunch of guys are surrounding him and they're gonna fight him well, and we should yeah. we should say by the way that Joey has been watching this whole thing. Joey walks up and tries to pull Shane away from the situation. You wouldn't want me to run away, would you? There's a pause, and Joey says, "Look, there's too many, Shane." And it's such a great moment because, like, here you have a gunslinger who's even with the little child trying to still look like the hero or the legend that the little child has created in his head about him, and he says to him, "You know, you, you want me to run?" And he's like, "No, it's, but there's too many," and then he ushers him out. And so begins. Well, and Joey watched him just barely win yeah, a one-on-one yeah. fight. Right. And now right. there's, you know, now there's all these guys and man, they go right into it. And yeah. Shane is doing really, really well. Yeah. Initially does really, really well. Yep. Uh, but then he kind of gets surrounded and grabbed and they're going at him and Joey runs out. I'm going to kill Shane. And yeah. Start grabs a big hunk of wood and comes in swinging. Yeah. And this to me is like taking the stump out of the ground. This is the two brothers, mm. you know, fighting the battle together. Yep. And it's it's great. It's a great fight scene. An axe handle is very, it can come in handy very much in a lot of situations. Let me just say that. And it certainly Absolutely. comes in handy here. Yeah. <laughs> you mean there at your house in San Diego? <laughs> well, you know, you got to move some stuff around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, uh, by the way, this is shot on three, three strip technicolor. What that means is the way they got color at the beginning was they couldn't really make color film. What they Mm. could make was red, green, and blue strips of film, each creating one piece of the color, which essentially means you have three film cameras rolling in sync built into one camera. Mm. That's how you do three strip technicolor. And then it's combined later to create the color film. These are big, huge honking cameras Mm -hmm. that they're hauling out to the middle of nowhere in Wyoming and then shooting. And I love that the store guys go and, hey, stop breaking all my stuff. Man, the the insurance bills for saloons in the Old West must have been very expensive. Uh, I'm just saying, yeah, like guys. But then again, you're like, well, I got to serve the beer. I got to serve the liquor or they won't come in. But if I serve it, they're going to get into fights. So it's it's going to See, they must have just a whole bunch of chairs and tables in the back <laughs> ready yeah. to roll out. And then I love the guys are back to back. They smile at each other during the fight. They both take chairs over the head and keep fighting. And finally we hear Stop it! Stop it, man! Stop it! It's like, why weren't you yelling that the whole time? Mm-hmm. Um <laughs> But Start and Shane have basically won. Yeah. And it's funny, 
at the beginning of the fight, Riker said, I'll pay for the damage. And at the end of the fight, Star says, Riker won't pay for the damage, not a nickel of it. I'm paying for what's broken. No, by Godfrey, we're paying for what's broke. Me and Shane. <laughs> Me and that's, Shane. That's, Wait a minute. What, what, it's I, like, what? hey, dude, I didn't. I don't have any money. I just paid yeah. two bucks and two bits for my pants. <laughs> They all leave. We're left with Riker in the bar, which is pretty much the saloon is their headquarters. Yeah. And he says, Put one of the boys on a good horse. It's been a long trip. All the way to Cheyenne. I'm through fooling, Grant. From now on, when we fight with them, the air is going to be filled with gun smoke. So things are going to get serious. Yeah. We're back at the homestead. Uh, Marion's putting on some bandages and cleaning them up. I love that there's this moment where she's going to put turpentine on his <laughs> wounds. I mean, I've had alcohol put on a on a on a cut. I, turpentine sounds really painful. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and, it does. Right? Yeah, and we send Joey off to bed, and we hear through the door. I just love Shane. Do you? I love him almost as much as I love Bob. That's all right, isn't it? And Shane is listening to this whole conversation. Don't you like him, Mother? And on Don't You Like Him, Mother, he gets up and leaves. And we hear... Yes, I like him too, Joy. It's so weird how many times the question of their feelings for each other are brought up in some weird way. Yeah. And she comes out, opens up that Dutch door to look for him, and in that moment, out comes Starrett. What's the matter, honey? Joe, hold me. Don't say anything. Just hold me tight. Why do you think she wants him to hold her in that moment? Women are complex individuals. And, True. And uh, we spend a majority of our lifetime trying to figure out women. And it's um, they're just an ocean of mysteries. And I think in this moment, and it's then that's why we love them so much. They are constant. We are constantly in a place of trying to figure out. And there's a moment where the, where there's a the reason I think this moment happened is because. She has these feelings for Shane, uh, but him holding her is like, that's the, you know, this is the life I have, you know, uh, give me some comfort here because I don't want to have these feelings for him. I don't want to, you know, open the door to another possibility. I want to be reminded of the comfort and the strength I have with you, you know? And so I, that's what I think, but I'm a man. I'm sure there's plenty of women listening. who are like, you're totally fucking wrong. This is what's going on. So I don't know. Well, and I think, too, like there's a difference between the long term companionship and deep relationship of Joe and Marion and yeah. this stranger that came into town, you yeah. know, and, and and this is the thing. And it's so funny. It can, you know what this makes me think of in this weird way is uh, Arthur Lancelot and Guinevere Yeah, is in my conception of those characters. And, and if I were to ever do an Arthurian story, which if anyone wants to give me the money, I would love to do <laughs> to me, that's the center of the story. And if you, and when, if you don't get one element of those relationships, right, it hurts. And and so often you see Guinevere or Lancelot portrayed as villains, yeah. you know, and to me, the secret is they all love each other and they love each other in different ways. And that's what I see here. There's no anger between these three, even though there's this weird, attractions going on between them yeah you know yeah and i love the moment as we hear joey yell out night ma night pa <laughs> and then really loud night shane <laughs> <laughs> so good <laughs> it's, it's daytime the music is ominous and a writer we could even say a pale writer rides Ew. into town yeah jack palance oh he's great yeah Walter Jack Pounce. I, I didn't even know he, I mean, it's, I haven't seen this film in a bit and Walter Jack Pounce. I, just, I yeah. don't know how that ever escaped me, man. I don't either. So he is, uh, bo- his parents are Ukrainian immigrants. His name is actually Volodymyr Palahunuk <laughs> is actually his name. <laughs> wow. Uh, he was in the army air Corps during world war two. His face was disfigured bailing out of a burning B 24 liberator. Hmm. And he had, Wow. reconstructive surgery and some people say that's why his cheekbones are so that part of it is from the injury and the reconstructive surgery that he had wow. Wow. because his face is unlike any other face you yeah. know yeah. it is so angular with those cheekbones um and he was a broadway actor and he'd done some tv and then 
in his, I think it's his first or second film, mm -hmm. uh, he gets a Best Supporting Actor nomination in Sudden Fear in 1952. Mm -hmm. One thing he had never done before this movie is ride a horse or shoot a gun. Wow. And apparently he was terrible. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so funny as a guy that became known as a Western guy, yeah. like, like real bad. And he was out between takes all the time practicing. Yeah. And <laughs> it sounds like there's some real <laughs> problems here. Um, and because he was actually supposed to gallop into town, yeah, but he couldn't do it. And so he, he, wa they walked the horse into town. And what Stevens later said, he's like, that's actually scarier. Like a lot of the really slow movements are because he couldn't do things quickly. <laughs> you know, I love everything about what Jack Palance does in this movie. I mean, because the way he comes in, just like Shane, right? This is, it's so funny. The, the It's a, you juxtapose both of these situations because he comes into town as well. Uh, and he barely says any words, barely does it. He's quiet himself. So there's this whole kind of, stigma around these gunfighters the way they're present or the some kind of approach these gunfighters the way they're presented in this movie that they're these quiet confident no-nonsense people in yep. these situations and so yeah though his his entrance is every bit as powerful as shane's just in a different way totally 100 percent um ernie who was the homesteader who was already on the way out is now definitely on the way out he's talking to stonewall I killed my soul last night Kept shooting and yelling what they do next. Woke up the kid and scared the missus half to death. And Stonewall's reaction is the opposite. Starrett and the rest of us are going to take the juice out of him one of these days. So it's we're going to have this big celebration because the 4th of July is coming and Shane is doing some work and Marion is looking through her clothes <laughs> to find something to wear. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. she tries on one hat and a dress and then she looks down in, the ch in her chest of clothes and pulls out a very fancy dress. It is, in fact, her wedding dress. Yeah. We're in the tack room. Shane is pulling away his saddle, and and there's Joey who says, Why don't you ever wear your six-shooter, Shane? Well, I guess I don't see as many bad men as you do. <laughs> and we talk more about the gun, and he says, You promised you'd show me how to shoot. Please. All right, Joey, come on. And they head out. Yeah. Now, first of all, apparently Alan Ladd hated guns. Really? Really hated wow. them. Wow. So all this stuff with guns was really hard for him to shoot, mm -hmm. um, to film. Took a lot of takes. Interesting. Okay. And right now he is giving Joey a lesson on how to be a gunslinger. Never have your holster at arm's length. You always have it here, where the grip is between the elbow and the wrist. And you know what it reminded me of? A movie we did long, long time ago is um, in Black Stallion where... Yeah. Um, Mickey Rooney is teaching the kid how to ride a horse, right? How to yeah. sit up in the saddle. It's yeah. just a very gentle, very real way. It's like, okay, you you want your holster here, and you put your elbow mm. here, and this is how you draw it. Gosh, is that the way real gunfighters do? No, Joey. Most of them have tricks of them. One, for instance, likes to have a shoulder holster. Another one puts it in his uh, the belt of his pants. And there are some who like two guns. The one's all you need if you can use it. And Marion, now wearing her wedding dress, has come around the building and she's listening. Let me see you shoot, Jane. What do you want me to shoot at? The little right rock over there, see? He stands, he looks at the rock, and he draws and fires. <laughs> Hits the rock multiple times. And what's so crazy, we're an hour plus into the movie. Yeah. yeah. This is the first gunshot we hear. Yeah. And it is loud. Mm -hmm. And it comes out of a silence, which makes it louder. And they did this by firing a really high caliber weapon into a metal garbage can to get oh, that wow. booming, echoing sound. And this is something that later on we're going to hear all the time of, right. of this. And this is the thing. Again, this goes back to him liberating Auschwitz and him seeing what he saw in World War II is he wanted the gun to be scary. Right. He, wanted, he didn't want it to be fun. He wanted it to be upsetting. Which it is, because that big bang is so loud. And the, by the way, the expression on the kid's face when he fires and then the whistle is so yeah. cute <laughs> and so funny because he's just like, this is awesome. Gosh almighty, that is good. And Marion is not happy. Mm -hmm. She sends Joey away and says, Guns aren't going to be my boy's life. And the kid is like, why do you have to spoil everything? And he starts going, bang, 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 because this was exciting to him. And... Shane's response is, A gun is a tool, Marion. 
No better, no worse than any other tool. An axe, a shovel, or anything. A gun is as good or as bad as the man using it. That's a that's a powerful line. It is. I mean, it's and it's almost. I don't know. It's really funny because I mean, you look at this and you go, okay. It's almost like as much as he may have had issues with guns, here he is kind of defending the use of guns. So it's very interesting as well. And you could look at it in both ways. You could look at it from a gun control point of view, or you could look at it from a gun rights point of view. So it's just very interesting, the speech. I think it's all about the stories we tell. And yeah. I think for him, like if if a gun is evil, that means he's he's evil, right. you know? If a gun is as good or as bad as the man using it, that means that he can use it for good. And I think... Mm-hmm. In this story, there's no question that it's a good thing that Shane had a gun. Yeah. Because if Shane didn't have a gun, then all these homesteaders lose their land. And it's like uh, Dr. Erskine says in Captain America, right? The serum, it only makes you, Mm. it only accentuates who you really are anyway. Yeah. So like anything. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, like there's another story you could tell, you know, that where instead of not firing when uh, Joey cocked the rifle at Shane, Mm. the very beginning of this movie, Shane murders a little kid. Yeah, right. That's all. You know what I mean? Story. I think that's that, and that's story. that's totally. what I mean. Like it's all in the story that you tell. Exactly. Um yeah. what story do we tell about guns? Yeah. And and I think and I don't we don't have to get into the politics of it at all, but the story of what a gun is to someone who is a serious gun owner and believes in, you know, second amendment stuff is a different right. story from the story that people who want restrictions on guns tell. Yeah. Yeah. And the story for the people that like guns is Shane going in and saving the town, you know, yeah. and the story the other people tell is people getting hurt, innocent people getting killed by guns. Yeah. We'd all be much better off if there wasn't a single gun left in this valley, including yours. Pa, Joe rides in, having heard the gunshot, and he, I, I'm surprised that he's not scared, you know? <laughs> yeah. And he sees Marion in that dress. Yeah. And he thinks she looks beautiful. And we head off to, our big celebration of the 4th of July, there's bucking Broncos, uh, there's all sorts of partying going on, and our Riker and his guys are hanging out in the saloon, <laughs> just there all the time. Yep. I think they're headquarters, man. Yeah, exactly. You know I want to be reasonable, but something's got to give. What I'm telling you, Rufus, nowadays out here a man can go just so far. Now, now going along with the new law, stayed away from gunplay. You've got to admit, Sam, my men have kept their six guns case. And Sam, who's the store owner, says, no. And he looks over at Jack Palance. Yeah. Who's just, I love how he's just quietly sitting. Yeah. His stillness and his silence. Yeah. It's his power in that, man. He just yeah. kind of looks up and looks right back down. And who walks into the bar but Tori? And we hear Dixie. Yeah. And he orders a jug of whiskey. And it's so, you know, you know that this is, <laughs> this is going to head in a bad direction. Here's to you, Rocker, for running Ernie Wright off his claim. I love that the little looks and moments between Riker and Wilson, who are sitting at the bar, and he goes, Is that one of them? Yeah. Because they're already pegging him as a guy to take out. I want to tell you something, Riker. He's running because he's a coward. And here's to me, because I ain't a coward. And you ain't getting my claim. What does he say to Wilson? I'd get him to draw without any trouble. Is that they want him to start something so they can kill him. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And send a message. Here's to the independence, the sovereign state of Alabama. Because he's still on the side of the Confederacy in the Civil War. And Tory heads out the door, hits those bat wing doors. And I love this, that he knocks one of the slats out so that we see Jack Palance revealed through the slats of the swinging bat wing door. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Um, we're in the party. There's fireworks. There's people dancing. We see Joe and Marion dancing. And then uh, one of the guys who's the known as the Swede, he's Swedish. You all know that day today is. It's Independence Day, except for one man here. This was the day uh, your star got himself hooked by Garley. <laughs> because this is their 10th anniversary. I gave up my independence 10 years ago today. <laughs> But uh, no man ever gave it up as easy as I did. <laughs> and and what's more, I, I wouldn't trade places with any man in this world. And in this shot, in the background, behind him, as he says, I wouldn't trade places with any man in the world, is Shane with his arm around Joey. Yeah. And the look on Alan Ladd's face, thats it's all in the silences. In this oh, movie. yeah. Absolutely. And everyone sings. 
And by the way, the song they're singing right now is the song that plays at, at Tori's funeral after he gets oh, killed. Wow. And Joe and Marion dance, and there's more singing and more joyful. This is like the joyful moment before the storm. Mm -hmm. This is that last happy moment we're going to have. And then Shane and Marion start to dance. Mm -hmm. It's, yeah, it, I have such complicated feelings about the Shane Marion relationship watching it this time. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, because it's, you know, yeah, it's this a, is a guy. You're, you're, here, you're talking all around it, Steve. Talk about it. What is it that bothers you about this? It doesn't bother. No, I shouldn't say it, it doesn't okay. bother me. It certainly doesn't bother me in terms of the filmmaking. It right. seems so real. This is a man in love mm. with another man's wife, or I don't even know if he's in love with her. I think, I don't think, I think what, love. I think what it is, is they each see or fantasize a different possible future. Yeah. This is a person I could be with. Right. Like I'm sure, I'm sure you know. We you've had that experience where you meet someone, and in the first few minutes, you go like, "Oh, this is someone I could be with." You oh, know? sure. And of course, you sure, don't sure. know that person at all. They could no. Might, and you, you get know, with they, them, and you're like, "Oh, wow, this is not this person is an insane not the right person." Thing at all. <laughs> I don't want to do this, but but just there's that moment in this connection, and and what I think is so interesting is they both know the other one is feeling it. Right. It's not. Right. It's not. Not only is it not one sided, but they both know it. Yeah. And the thing that's so great about it is that Joe is a great guy. Yes. You know, yes. that's what makes it so interesting and compelling mm -hmm. to watch in this film. Right. Right. He's a fantasy. Uh, Tori's talking about this other guy that has been hired. Strange. You decked out like a gunfighter. I didn't let that scare me, though. And Shane is listening. Did you say guns? Yeah. Two guns. What do you look like? You know him when you see him. Packs two guns, kind of lean. He wears a black hat. And they asked Shane. He a friend of yours? No. There's a man named Wilson who looks like that. He's a gunfighter. And they recognize the name. This Wilson. Would you know him, Shane? That is, if you saw him. And there's a long look, and Shane says, Maybe. If it is Wilson, he's fast, fast on the draw. What's so interesting is Shane hasn't said anything about his past. No, no. And most of the homesteaders didn't see Shane with the six-shooter. Yeah. You seem to know an awful lot about this kind of business, Shane. And he doesn't answer. It's amazing how they've gone from he's a coward to, oh, shit, this guy might be real trouble. Right. Um, and we go back into the tropes, right, of the West. And we see yep. this in a number of films where once a townsfolk has accepted somebody, then they find out this person's past and it may be a gunslinger past. All of a sudden, everything changes, right? And so you're seeing the townsfolk kind of slowly kind of maybe start to move away a little bit from Shane. And I love this line because there's a moment where someone says, I don't want no part of gunslinging. Murder's a better name for it. Yeah, right? That's a lot of the movie. And that's, you know, mm -hmm. let's look at all the things that we have right now. We mm -hmm. have Shane trying to put away his guns. We have right. Joey wanting nothing more than to play than guns and want Shane right. to use his guns. Right. We have Marion saying, I don't want any guns in this valley. Right. We have Riker, who has said, enough playing by the rules. I've tried to do this without guns. Let's bring back in guns. Yeah. We have a gunslinger who shows up, and we have people saying, I don't want any part of a gunslinger. This guy is someone not to mess with. They say, well, no, it's more like a murderer. Yeah. And then we have the, the homesteaders. They're right on the edge of leaving, and except for Starrett, who's going to stand up and, and says they'll have to take me out of here on in a box right. and Tori who is itching to prove that he's not a coward, as we've said before. And right. so all of this is heading towards a confrontation that is really complicated. And at this moment, I think it's a good time to end part one of our exploration of Shane. As always, we'd love to hear your thoughts on this great film. You can visit us on our Facebook page. You can uh, follow us on Twitter at Cine underscore files on Instagram at the Cinephiles podcast. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, where we would love to get your re reviews. I would say five stars. I think that yeah, seems sure. appropriate. I think five stars seems fair. Five yeah. stars seems nice. Um, but if you don't want to subscribe there, maybe do it on YouTube where you can leave your comments. You could do it on Spotify or Stitcher or even uh, through Anchor, which is our posting service. Um, 
And you can buy or stream Shane along with every other film we've ever reviewed on cinephiles.net. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash the cinephiles, where you can listen to combined versions of these two part episodes. Mm. You can suggest cinephile shorts. You can listen to our cinephile shorts and you can even suggest a film. And we're going to initiate some higher level tiers with some really mm-hmm. special special awards that we haven't figured out and yeah. all of the support on patreon is what helps us get going and uh you can reach me at sr morris or sr morris one on twitter and on instagram respectively and of course enterprise incidents where john is going to be a guest very very soon yeah. uh john how would people find you you can always find me at the roca says on twitter and on instagram and please if you haven't followed me on instagram follow me on instagram i'm trying to cross that twenty thousand subscriber mark and i'm only at sixteen thousand seven hundred, and i know what? that we have over 5,000 people that listen to us every week. So if you haven't followed me on Instagram, I'd appreciate you going over there and hitting the follow on the, uh, on at the Roca says there and uh, my uh, Patreon, I'm sorry, my, uh, my uh, Twitch channel. That's um, the outlaw nation, all one word, all one word there uh, on Twitch. And also uh, head on over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash John Roca says so close to crossing 20,000 subscribers there as well. So thank you. Um, how could there be 20,000 at one place and not 20,000 at the other place? All people should Come be on, subscribing people. to the outlaw in all places. Yeah, it's- don't make don't make me Wilson this thing. <laughs> don't make me Wilson this thing. I don't want to do it. <laughs> um, so on that note, uh, that's it for this week. And we'll back next week to continue our exploration of shame. <laughs>